Hello everyone, Christian from Production Journal here today, uh, and I'm joined by Laura Post, the voice of Harley Quinn. How are you today? I'm doing very well, thank you. Thanks for having me on. Oh, it's a pleasure to have you here. Um, yeah, so, you know, we've got the global pandemic going on. How's, how are you handling isolation at the moment? Um, I'm hanging in there. Uh, the nice thing about being a voice actor is that I can keep working from home in my closet. <laughs> So I got that going for me, and um, I'm doing some Twitch streaming to stay in touch with the outside world, I guess. So, you know, it's all right. That's right, yeah. Uh, and you're streaming uh, Persona 5 at the moment, aren't you? Yes, that's right. I have technically also streamed a bit of Undertale, but every time I ask people which one they want me to stream, they always say Persona 5 Royal, so I'm still streaming Persona 5 Royal. <laughs> hey, if it ain't broke, you know. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, and if you want to go uh, join Laura on her stream, it is uh, Laura Post Voice at Twitch TV. So That is right. Go check it out. <laughs> uh, so we have a huge uh, saturation of Harley Quinn in the media right now. She's become a really big pop culture icon in recent years uh, since Suicide Squad and the Batman Arkham games. So what do you find interesting about Harley Quinn? What I find interesting about Harley Quinn is that she's just had so many different, as you mentioned, she has so many different iterations in um, comics and the cartoons and film and each one is valid and completely like unique and different it has like its own little like spin my favorite thing about her is the sort of unpredictability of her as a character I feel like that's a through line for every iteration of Harley Quinn is that you don't ever really know exactly what's going to pop out of her that's um, something she kind of has in common with Joker uh, so that's probably my favorite thing about her in general. But I, I like characters that make you laugh. And Harley always is good for a laugh. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And he's talking about like the, the unpredictability of it. And especially uh, with this iteration of the character, she's sort of her own villain and more independent. Um, mm -hmm. And so with her sort of leading the charge, having literally nothing holding her back, it's a whole lot more threatening. <laughs> oh, yes, absolutely. Uh, yeah, so speaking on from that, how familiar were you with the character before the game? Um, I'd say on a scale of one to 10, which is 10, I am an encyclopedia of knowledge and one Harley who, I was probably at like an eight. I'm a pretty big fan of Batman and the Batman universe and like DC in general. So I had seen quite a few different iterations of Harley Quinn over the years. Batman the Animated Series is my favorite TV show of all time. Same. So that's where she got her start. <laughs> so, you know, um, I, I was pretty familiar with her. Um, familiar with her enough, in fact, that when I got the audition, I was like, well, I'm not going to get this. So I sort of just did my own thing with it, which I guess worked out in the end. <laughs> oh, exactly. Yeah. You yeah. created your own, like, really unique take of it, which is incredibly special. So, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> There's something to be said for being sort of set free by not holding yourself to any expectations, I guess. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Um, yeah. So you said that... Um, the animated series was probably your favorite interpretation of it, right? I mean, it is it is the the classic, the pinnacle. I mean, Mad Love is really, really good. I have the comic of it as well as, you know, having seen it and own the DVDs and Blu-rays of Batman the Animated Series. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. So prob Mad Love is is a really good one. And I mean it's it's classic Harley right there. Um, so I'd probably pick that. Uh, I also really enjoyed the one uh, in the animated series where she teams up with uh, Batman and does that like whole song and dance number. That's a great episode <laughs> for Harley. I like that one too. But just as like, you know, what's, what's my favorite overall story? It's probably Mad Love. Interesting. Interesting. Uh, I didn't mean to cut you off before. You were just saying something about uh, Arlene Sorkin. Oh, Arlene Sorkin is just, I mean, she originated the character. She is, as far as I'm concerned, she is Harley Quinn. And everybody else is just sort of riffing on what she created along with Paul Dini. You are talking about creating your own uh, unique spin on it. And, and you said that you didn't even expect to get the part at all because you did something so entirely different, right? Well, I just sort of, especially at the time that I auditioned for Harley Quinn, uh, I was... Uh, personally booking a lot more deeper voiced characters and you know I was just kind of like oh they're gonna go for one of their like there's there's you know five women in town that do Harley and like Tara does a lot of 
Harley and she's excellent at it. So I was kind of mm. like, oh, they're just, they're going to get one of their Harleys, you know? Mm. So I didn't think much of it. Uh, and I was like, so I'm just going to not worry. I'm not going to try and do any of that because if they wanted to get Tara Strong's Harley, they'll just get Tara Strong. So I uh, looked at the audition copy and uh, what I found really interesting in the audition sides is that she was, a, in a way, she she was much more, um, I don't want to say intelligent, but like she was more cunning. She was more manipulative. She was a little bit more strategic in the choices she was making, in the words that she was saying and the things she was doing in the audition sides, I felt like. And there was a lot of she still had that like showmanship aspect. I mean, obviously she's still Harley Quinn. She's still putting on clown makeup and she's making a big, big production of it. But there were parts in the audition sides where I was like, oh, here's where she's just like a real person that's really just over everything else going on around her. So I kind of let a bit of that sneak in. And I felt like those moments were really what kind of created this Harley Quinn for Telltale. Mm, absolutely yeah and then I mean even as, as a player when I'm going through it it's it's always as if she's just sort of like she's got like a certain level of tolerance and it's like all right now now you're just pissing me off <laughs> exactly exactly yeah it's like she's she's all fun and games until she's not all fun and games <laughs> anymore you know um she yeah I just and and the other thing I really liked about Telltale's Harley Quinn that I also think kind of came through in the audition sides was that well, I'm like, oh, yeah, here's, like, the real her. You never actually know where is her real her. Like, it's like, oh, she's being vulnerable in this moment. But is she, is that really her? Or is she doing it to manipulate me? Because she she was really, I mean, she's a, a psychologist. She was a very smart lady. So I, I liked that about the character as well. Yeah, interesting. It's probably, uh, I'd say, the first iteration where we don't, necessarily see like her life before she becomes Harley it's just sort of yeah. like she's there and then throughout mm -hmm. the game there's like you, you sort of find out a little bit about her but nothing concrete you know no and you're not even sure if she's telling the truth or not <laughs> for, for exactly but you're like mm, okay yeah yeah and I guess that's that's the whole thing about Telltale it's it's uh that they play into deception and lies a lot about it so it's yeah. sort of up to the player to be like, well, are they telling me the full truth? Are they just twisting my arm? What's going on? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and you said that, um, you know, you did your own spin and I guess that can be also owed to Telltale how they've, they've taken all these characters and they do something completely different for them and mm -hmm. you just would have fit right in there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and um, in the audition sides, you know, like I said, there were a couple things where I was like, oh, that seems like a sort of a different a place where I can do something different than what I think of as classic Harley Quinn. But it was when I actually went in to record, it was so much different from, you know, I didn't realize that it was like, I mean, I guess I must have had, because I had played the original game. So I knew that John Doe was already in it, but uh, I didn't realize exactly how much they were going to kind of um, flip that relationship dynamic on its head, which was really fun to work with, to not be like all about Mr. J all the time, but instead... Mm have him following me around <laughs> so that was that was that was really cool all right so developing off of that uh did you realize coming into this uh that the joker's relationship would be the complete opposite no not at all uh i did not realize that uh it was gonna be harley kind of making joker into joker well along with bruce depending on what routes you take um i didn't realize it was gonna sort of we were going to play off that dynamic as opposed to Harley actually being a henchman quote, quote to Joker. It's Joker's more of a henchman quote, quote to Harley, which was really cool and fun. And uh, I liked the, the power dynamic between her and Bruce and John. Uh, there's that, there's a scene back at the, the pact at the headquarters for the pact where like Harley is like, Hey, quit playing with my toys <laughs> and it's it's like a, I really liked that scene that was really fun to work on so how did it feel to be a female DC lead in this video game it felt really really awesome um I had always always wanted to work with Telltale because I had been a fan of theirs 
for a really long time. <laughs> so uh, it was really cool to get to work with them as a company. And it was really cool as a DC fangirl to get to be such an iconic character in the DC universe. Um, and it was just... Uh, <laughs> It was a little overwhelming. I cannot say that I wasn't nervous for my first like three sessions. I was like, oh my God, don't mess this up. Don't get recast. Don't mess this up. Just be good. <laughs> be worthy. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it, it worked out. They kept me. Phew. <laughs> well, absolutely. You did an amazing job with it. Thank you. <laughs> um, so yeah, well, let's, let's, you know, actually delve into that. Um, what was it like working with Telltale? They were an incredible group to work with as an actor. Um, I felt like they they spent a lot of time with us as actors, just making not just you know making sure we, they got like the read they needed, but like making sure that we all had the read that made sense for the character in the context, and uh, you know they they weren't afraid to like play around with lines and sort of tweak them on the fly and come back and revisit things after we'd like gone forward just to make sure that it was really the exact right performance. And also it's one of the few companies that I've ever worked with that um, has had us do any kind of partner or group records. So for my second or third Harley Quinn session, I actually had me in with Troy doing Bruce so that we could play off of each other, which was really really like a, a pure luxury in the world of video games i've never worked with a partner in a video game before only um only in animation have i had group records or partner records so that was really really cool they cared a great deal about the performance and the writing and getting it just right so that was just a treat working with them interesting i don't i wasn't even aware of that i didn't i didn't even know that there was um you know, that, that dynamic where you could actually work in the same room with them, or even if you're in a booth, that never even occurred to me at all. Yeah, they had us in two different booths, so we didn't have to worry about bleeding over for, um, like, if I said something, it didn't carry on his mic, etc. But we were still there live doing it together, which was really cool. And then even then, if we didn't, weren't in the same room, if they had the other actors' recordings, they would play them for me either like for a lead in for the line so that I could work off of it. I assume if I recorded first, they did it for the other actors uh, as well, but that was also really nice. Uh, you know, it takes a little extra time, but I feel like it really enhances the performances in the end. So it was really nice to, to sort of have that collaborative um, experience. Hmm. Hmm. And so, yeah, with the, the whole nature of telltale games, is that there's all these different options you can choose from. So mm -hmm. what was the process for recording all of those? Um, generally speaking, we would, you kind of would go through a scene the same way that it would be, I guess, programmed. So like you do the first line, that's the intro, and then they'd have all of the like feed in lines. So if it was, you know, what are you doing here? then the next line you'd be like, it would say, you know, Bruce says, none of your business. And then I say, oh, it sounds like you want to get your head beat in, you know? <laughs> and then the next one would be like, Bruce says, oh, I'm sorry, Harley. And I would go, you're darn right, you're sorry, or something like that. So we do it scene by, like um, each uh, dialogue choice was almost like a scene, if you want to think about it that way. Um, and they'd always tell us when we'd like come back around to like, okay, now we're back into main, like we've gone through the branching dialogue. Now we're back to main story where you return to this base level until we get to the next decision. <laughs> right, right. So you sort of had to say a line and then reset back and just do it all differently. Um, I mean, you knew where you were coming from. Like they, a lot of times too, they'd play you your own previous line. So that like, so if it was, what are you doing here? And then you have Bruce going, none of your business. I would go and say my line. And then we'd go back to, they'd play the, what are you doing here? And then we'd act the, the next response for each thing. Do you think there's an intended way to play the story? Um, I mean, that's the nice thing about Telltale is that there isn't. But the, the vigilante joker version is just such a unique take on the character of joker that it's really hard 
to not do that. Plus, I feel like most of the people playing the game, you become so attached to John and you want so badly to stop him from becoming the Joker that you wind up doing the vigilante route most of the time. Um, there's so much good stuff in the villain route that I feel bad that, you know, saying necessarily that vigilante Joker is the way to go. Um, but I mean, it's, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's just so well written. Both are well written, but Vigilante Joker is so unique that it's hard to, you know, not test it out and do it yourself. Speaking from having played with friends, because the way I mostly played through it is because since I knew every possible choice and every possible outcome kind of uh, changes the telltale experience. So the way I would play it is I'd have friends come over and they'd make all the decisions so that I could kind of experience it through them. And uh, yeah, everybody wanted to pick Vigilante. I did yeah. it on my own so that I could see it and see how it turned out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's it's a bit of a double-edged sword. So I yeah, I, I played two two different playthroughs, and I did uh, Vigilante first um, mm -hmm. before I even started recording. So I just wanted to see what it was like, um, yeah. and and I felt like both were equally compelling. And and it, you have that much sympathy for the characters that whether he goes bad or, or he remains a vigilante and then goes bad, it just makes sense. And you yeah. just feel sorry yeah. for him. It's amazing. Oh yeah. It's, it's, yeah. The villain route is really well written and I like it a lot. I, I like a lot of the stuff Harley has to do in that one too. You know, it's a tough call, but um, the other thing I really like is that they, I mean, and again, this is a hallmark of telltale games. There's a lot of really hard decisions to make. Cause like um, for example, with, with Catwoman, where it's like, oh, Catwoman's the traitor and they're like putting her in the, the ice thing. And it's like, oh man, you can save her, but there's gonna be a huge cost if you do, or you cannot save her, but whoo, that's not great. That's not a real Batman type thing to do either, is it, huh? And you're just stuck in that like rock and a hard place. Not to mention the last decision of the game that I won't say, but that's like such a, oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's a way to end the game there. <laughs> oh, absolutely. So when, when yeah. you did your own playthrough, did you throw her under the bus or did you, did you take a bullet for her? Um, in, I'm trying to remember cause I've done both. Yeah. So I'm like, I think in my playthrough, I threw her under the bus because I wanted to see Harley scenes and I'd see more Harley if I went with everybody. <laughs> Sorry, Selena. Um, but the ones with my friends, I think that they, they uh, I think they saved her. I think that they saved her. So, you know, yeah. cool for them, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I remember in my first playthrough, I sort of uh, grew so attached to Bruce being undercover that mm -hmm. even though I felt bad about it, I'm like, I got, I got to try and do this. And I, and I, and I said it was her and then went to the black mm -hmm. site with the villains. Honestly, I think it's a much better choice. It's so much cooler when you go there. Oh yeah. 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 There's so much you miss out on by not like, if you don't go, you miss out on so much. Mm. Not to and mention I, a lot of people die. <laughs> I was about to say that. I've said that in my, yeah. in my critique that you can choose, uh, what would you say? The, the bad choice of, 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 you know, throwing a cat woman in there. But mm -hmm. in doing that, you, you can save a lot of people. Yeah, exactly. Because you're able to stay with the pact and keep them from doing too much crazy stuff because we know what happens when they're left alone. Harley is not exactly a fan of moderation. <laughs> <laughs> One of the really hard decisions in the game is that, you know, you can choose to go to the black site with the pact or save Selena and yeah, you can save Selena, but a lot of people die if you don't, because if you go with the pact, you can sort of keep them from causing too much damage, because at that point in the game, you know Harley, you know she's not exactly a fan of moderation. So you can go and sort of keep them in check, but then you're going to sacrifice your lover, partner, who knows what exactly your relationship with Catwoman is at that point. Uh, and that's a really hard decision to make and a really Batman decision to make because that's like the other thing that's really nice is that it's like those are the kind of decisions that you see in really good Batman stories 
where it's like, ooh, decide between like the one person that I really care about or the better, the greater good, the more lives, you know, that sort of thing. I, good Batman storytelling. One of the things I loved about playing the first season, and I mean, it carries into the second season too, is, you know, when I first started playing the first season and they sort of get into um, the, the history of the Waynes, I was like, mm, I don't know if I like this because I'm, I'm very protective of my Batman and my Batman stories. But then I kind of was like, no, I like this. I like this change to his backstory because it gives the player the freedom to sort of tweak Batman's personality or persona in a different kind of an Elseworlds that isn't, you know, because we know what Batman acts like in the comic books with Batman's history. And like, he's, that's Batman and Batman doesn't do this. And Batman would definitely do that. And I mean, I've got strong opinions about what Batman does and doesn't do. But in this world, because they've sort of tweaked his backstory just enough, it gives the player that kind of freedom to be like, well, maybe this Batman wouldn't do that. And maybe this Batman would consider this possibility, you know? Um, which I really liked in the I ended up absolutely adoring the first season and uh, I it carried into the second season so that you know there's just even more gray there's no clear cut like oh well here's the good guy decision and here's the bad guy decision it's really much more about what's your style of being a superhero as a player which is really cool and fun it's interesting you say that and and I could not have said that any better myself. That was brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So I think, I think I sort of had the same reaction to you when they sort of inserted um, bits of the, these, these little things into the story that you're just like, I don't know about that. And then you sort of, it, you say develop and then you sort of, you, you come to understand it and then it develops yeah. into something where it's like, Oh, now I really have to care for this because if I don't, something worse could happen. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I know you, you said you don't want to talk about it. So if you don't, just let me know. But you said the last decision of the game. Yes. <laughs> did, you, did you want to discuss that? I mean, as long as your viewers are okay with spoilers, which I guess if they're watching yeah. a review, they're probably okay with spoilers for a couple years old game. But yeah, oh yeah. my gosh, yeah. And that one blindsided me because obviously at that point in the game, I was not recording anymore. So I didn't know what decisions were coming up. And I was like, Oh no, <laughs> this is a very unfortunate decision to have to make. Like how, how, how do you even make that? It's like, you can't, it's, so you, you have to decide to be, give up Batman or give up Alfred. And I'm like, but how do you, you can't be Batman without Alfred. Like it's, it's just this, it's an impossible question in my mind. I'm, I picked, I gave up Alfred and I kept being a Batman because I love Batman and thought that there might be another game. Um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, it, oh, yeah, it's, it's rough when you have to make that decision. It doesn't matter what everything else you've done in the game already hurts, but you kind of see it come, you know, you, like, you know, even when you pick vigilante Joker, you know, it's not going to turn out well, you know, he's still Joker, right? But then it's just like, oh, also Alfred's leaving. And you're like, what? No. <laughs> he's like, he's like the little, he's like your, your nice comfy blanket that you come home and he makes you tea and you feel better and it's okay. And he's just like, no, I think what we're doing is wrong. I can't, I can't stay here and do this. And it's like, oh no, <laughs> it's just very unfortunate. It's a really, really hard decision to make. It's the hardest decision in any of the games I think and it's rough and then it's like the last one you make and then the game's over and you're just sort of sitting there like but who will remember this you know yeah I will exactly. remember this <laughs> yeah yeah I mean that's the thing about but it's a thing in telltale games but it's a thing I love because it's a thing in life like you think you're doing the right thing and then it's like oh well guess that that's not how I expected that person to react to that choice, but that was what I said. And well, now I have to deal with trying to fix it after the fact, I guess, you know, mm. I, I don't know. I love, I love telltale games in general. Um, yeah. Well, yeah. And, and, yeah. and honestly, I think that 
Um, and I only played a little bit of The Walking Dead because I was probably a bit too young when I started playing that <laughs> uh, and I never picked it up again. Um, but you know, hopefully when it's on sale, I'm going to pick it up again. Yeah. But with um, what you say about that is it, it sort of reflects real life. And honestly, I, f- I feel like it's made even me more conscious about my decisions. And so when I'm talking to someone, I've got to, you know, you, you sort of got to consider how they're feeling or, you know, how they might yeah. react and, yeah, and exactly. it reflects real life. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, to the point that like me and my friends is like, we'll be like having a conversation or playing a board game or something. And I mean, we do it in jest, but it'll be like, oh, Laura will remember this. Yeah. The <laughs> fact that like we say that out loud, that is just such an iconic, like, oh, it's just such a good mechanic and so iconic and just excellent. I, I love it. I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm a big fan. Like I said, when I, uh, got the, when I got the part, I was like, oh my God, I've always wanted to work with Telltale. So I was over the moon for that. Yeah. And it's interesting you, you say that, uh, you know, Laura will remember this because even though it's just like a, Hey, you know, th- something's changed in the game. It's always like, it feels like a threat. It's like, Hey, it you, know, you, know, you know, that choice you made, think about it. <laughs> yeah. Hope you made the right one. That's, yeah, exactly. like all, that's all that that note is, is that it's like, well, that affected things. And you're like, what do you mean that affected things, you know? <laughs> um, and probably the scariest one, in, in, in my opinion, was um, at the end of episode five, for, for any of the endings for season two, was when it says the Joker will never forget that. Oh my God, I know. It's yeah, just I was just small, thinking about subtle, that moment oh. too. Yeah, th- those little things that like, the, the, the way that they're able to play with that too, that one's brilliant. But also there's like the ones where it's like the Joker has already forgotten that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> Joker totally fun. forgot to remember that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what is your favorite aspect of the game? Oh man. Uh, I mean, it's, it's everything we've all, my favorite aspect of the game is everything we've already been talking about. It's the character interactions and getting to through your decisions of how you interact with characters watch those characters develop whether it's john or um or alfred or harley or the commissioner it it's all um you know there are people whose lives can be saved or destroyed just because of what seemed like at the time innocuous decisions you made or like how is your relationship with Selena going to work if you, you know, were flirting here, but then you sold her down the river here or vice versa, you know? Um, it's, it's the writing in these games is just always my favorite part for sure. I mean, it's just really good storytelling and you get really invested. And like I said, the other, my other favorite part is that there aren't, it's not a clear cut decision of like, here's your, renegade choice and here's your moral choice what are you are you a good person or a bad person it's like oh well do you save this agent or do you save this civilian go and you and and there's a timer so it's not like you get to sit in him and haw about it either you know you have to it's it feels it feels kind of like a simulation of being a like a superhero simulation except you're not actually having to punch anything in real life which good because then i do very poorly Um, (laughs) But yeah, it's, it's, it's fun. It's fun to play pretend in those worlds. And that's what I feel like when you're playing a telltale game, you're playing pretend and it's great. Right. And yeah. And, and you're talking about um, just sort of that looming threat of the timer steadily shrinking as you've got oh to gosh, pick yeah. between two huge ultimatums and probably one of, one of the worst, not when I say worst, I mean the most dangerous decisions, the one that, made me sort of like pause the game and be like, oh, well, that's that, uh, <laughs> was, was in season one when you have to choose between Selena Kyle and Harvey Dent. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mate, it's that like... was threatening. <laughs> yeah. Side note, I, ch- I chose Harvey. Really weird playing through the game when you cho- choose Harvey as a side note because he you save him so he doesn't have the, like, damage. <laughs> But everything still kind of goes through as though he did. It's it's a little weird. I still liked it, but it was like, huh? I don't know. Just so well, let's let's talk about that. So okay, I guess it sort of reflects more that you know the, the the true ugly nature of Harvey Dent isn't the physical scars, but the mental ones. Oh yes, absolutely. It wasn't a problem in the writing. It was just sort of like 
when I made that decision and then watching the rest of the story play out, it was one of those, like, I feel like maybe I was supposed to go for Selena. You know what I mean? Just mm. plot wise. Like it felt like it was leaning that way. Not that I had a inferior experience having chosen Harvey, but it was just sort of like, Oh, I see how this would play out vice versa. You know what I mean? Mm, mm. Yeah. Yeah. All right. That's yeah. That's interesting. Cause then, yeah. And, and you sort of see him, um, I, f I feel like it, it's, probably more compelling to see him without the scars and see him turn into a monster because you can still yeah, clearly see like, that he's your friend. Yeah. Yeah. You're like, I, it's, yeah, you feel very, you feel frustrated because you're like, I'm doing everything I can. And why, why? Well, but the thing is that happens in real life too. I've had friends where it's like, I'm trying so hard to help you and you were just being very self-destructive mm. and I don't know what else to do except sort of watch and try to mitigate the damage. And that's, it's a very good, um, it's a very good, what's the word I'm looking for? Interpretation of that feeling when you're playing through season one. With yeah, Barbie. like sort of that, that concept of uh, lack of control. Yeah. But trying because you're Batman, you're trying to fix everything. Mm. But it's just that's not the way the world always works. Yeah, and, and <laughs> exactly. And you and and by that point, you're not even playing only as Batman, but you're playing as Bruce Wayne. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, uh, just fast forwarding to season two, between mm -hmm. um, and again, this is this is sort of. Uh, another thing that's not necessarily put on the back burner, but it's always it's always there that you got to consider. Did you side with Amanda Waller or Commissioner Gordon? Gordon. <laughs> yes, always Gordon. Gordon's my bro. I I know I know too much about Waller and like the comics and everything that I can't be like, oh yes, Waller's trustworthy. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So and I I did the complete opposite one in um in my first playthrough. I went all mm -hmm. the way with Wall, and I felt bad because you know Gordon's like your best friend. He's always yeah. there for you. He's yeah. He's your he's your bro. <laughs> yeah. He's he's got an absolute heart of gold, and I felt he's so bad being like. I want to work with you, but she, like, you know, she knows my identity, you know, she can get stuff done. <laughs> we saw in um, the vigilante route that Harley Quinn was sort of picked up for the Suicide Squad. Yeah, yeah, she was. I was like, oh, that's cool. <laughs> right. So finishing, uh, you know, finishing that episode and you can sort of see, and, and it depends on how you play it. And I'm sure you've noticed, right. um, you can sort of make her doubt herself. You know, she's always like, I'm in control here. It's all right. You know, I, I got a fancy new hammer. You know, I've got my own squad. But at the end of the day, she's just a puppet. Yeah, absolutely. So what do you think is next for Harley Quinn? Um, <laughs> I think if there was more uh, and we had saw Harley, I think she'd be either making an attempt to leave the agency escape from the agency or already on the run from the agency uh and i think we'd get more into i think she'd become a little bit more like the harley we know from like suicide squad where she's still independent of joker obviously but um is is not necessarily a bot like a boss the way she is in pact uh the way she is for the pact uh i think she'd be more of a lone wolf like ah, nope i'm tired of having other people around they just screw with your plans and mess everything up so now i just do everything on my own kind of chick <laughs> all right so now we're sort of nearing the uh, the end of the interview um so i just want to say is there anything else you'd like to add at all um no, I thank you for having me. This was fun. I, I got I got nothing. I feel like I've talked about everything that could possibly be Harley. <laughs> well, I'm I'm happy that yeah you know, that yeah you had the opportunity to do that. Thank you very much yeah, for doing this. No, thank you so much. Um all right, so if you could say anything to your fans at all, what would you say? Um <laughs> if I could say anything to my fans, I would say thank you so much for existing. Um, and thank you to the people that take time out of their day just to even send like a little tweet saying that you like something I've done. It seems, I know that we don't always respond to everything because we get lots of tweets and stuff, but just that one little like, 
hey, I really liked you as fill in the blank. It really kind of makes your day because you just, you're like, oh, good. Somebody's actually listening to something I did <laughs> because we all work and live in a vacuum. And it's sort of like we're, we're performing with the goal of getting a reaction from the audience. But unlike in stage and things like that, we never really get to know what that reaction is. It just sort of exists once we've done it and we hope for the best and cross our fingers. So those little tiny little like thank yous or good jobs really mean all the world. So thanks for those. Cool. Awesome. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for, uh, for hanging out today. I was yeah, very happy to like have you. Said, thanks for having me. It was, this is really fun. Hey guys, Christian from Production Journal here, and today I'm joined by Anthony Ingruber, the voice of John Doe slash the Joker from Batman the Telltale series. How are you today? I'm good, man. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm not bad. I'm not bad. How are you coping through uh, the whole isolation period? Uh, yeah, not much has changed from my daily schedule, so I, if you hadn't told me, I wouldn't even notice that anything's going on, but <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's not too bad. <laughs> Awesome. And uh, hey, congrats on the engagement uh, just a little bit earlier this month. Good on you. Oh, thanks, man. Yeah, I, uh, I tricked my girlfriend into marrying me somehow. <laughs> it's that old joke <laughs> <of> charm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Looking at the very beginning of your career, you started with all of your different impressions on YouTube um, from various actors and various portrayals of the Joker. Uh, and now the Joker is considered like the modern day Hamlet role. It's probably the most sought out role. Um, so what do you find interesting about the character? Um, yeah, that's the thing. I mean, the character is 90 years old, I think. Um, and ironically, he's still timeless. Like, it, it's a character that hasn't really aged because he's been interpreted so many different ways, not just um, through the actors involved, but also the comic book has, has, has uh, undergone so many different iterations of this one character that started out you know, as a murderer, um, and then became sort of a lovable trickster in the 60s for the kids, and then more like um, the sort of classic uh, Joker that we're more familiar with to being a complete psychopath and all these kind of different things. Um, so it's so interesting that a, a villain like that, which is on paper quite quite simple, you know, a, a clown, um, kind of, uh, has become so complex and, and his origin stories are open to so many different interpretations. And I think that it lends itself to being ambiguous um, in terms of uh, interpretation like of, of how he should be performed or written, which I think, you know, makes him so iconic as well because you can have so many different versions of this one character. Um, yeah, <laughs> it's kind of interesting that way. Hmm. Okay, yeah. And so throughout all of these different interpretations that you're speaking, we've got so many uh, live actions, I'm sorry, live action ones, uh, you know, from Mark Hamill uh, through to Jack Nicholson, more recently Joaquin Phoenix and Jared Leto, uh, and even some more of the animated ones. Um, so how did your impressions leak into your performance as John Doe? Uh, well, that, yeah, that was the funny thing is that I, when I auditioned, um, I submitted four files and uh, I, I obviously I didn't think I would get it. I, the game was already on like the third episode when I got the audition file. So I thought, you know, what, how is this not cast yet? I mean, I would think that the Joker would be the first character that you cast alongside with Batman. Um, but uh, I, so I submitted something that was just, um, you know, uh, the Hamill, Jack and the um, Heath Ledger impression things. So I was like, okay, you know, I'll show that. So I, you know, I have that in, the, in there, but then I wanted to submit something that was more um, original, like my own sort of interpretation of the character. Um, and yeah, that, that was the, the, the tricky thing was just not doing the impression because, you know, they, they I found out later, they really didn't want a Hamill or, um, or a Ledger or, or a Nicholson. Um, they wanted something that was different. Uh, and and um, so that was, that was really a challenge. And, and so I, I, had to sort of incorporate my own history of the character, like what I knew of him and how he was uh, conventionally portrayed, um, but then trying to flip it on its head and do something different. Uh, but, you know, my own fanboyism came out and uh, I, did, I did use elements of the actors that inspired me, you know, um, throughout, the, uh, throughout the performance, just to sort of uh, give some sort of thing of like, okay, this is how 
he's familiar to people, but still be different, uh, if that makes any kind of sense. <laughs> uh, and that, that was sort of my approach, was just trying to pay homage, fancy word, uh, while still doing something original uh, with, with it that, that would fit in this universe. That wouldn't just be a rehash of uh, someone else's performance, um, was how I kind of went into it. It's amazing, yeah. Um, and so you, I saw that you said in the other interview, and I'm not too sure if you're allowed to elaborate on this, so just stop me if you can't. Um, but you said that when you went into it and you, you, did, a, you did a few readings um, and the backstory was changed just before you started recording. So how did that sort of contribute to you and your own version um, of the Joker? Yeah, that, that's the thing. He, he, I mean, even to a casual viewer, you have to you have to admit that the the season one Joker is t totally different from season two, um, <clears throat> and you know it was surprising because um, you know this was my first voiceover role professionally. I'd, I've never done professional voiceover before for for any kind of AAA title except for a few indie things and self made stuff, you know. Um, and I wasn't aware that the actor is literally the last person to see the script. Um, you know, with a film or something, you have six months, you lock yourself in your trailer, you go over every line religiously until you have it, you know, down. This was like, here, have your script recorded. And, so, and they were throwing curveballs at me all the time. And, and that was true because um, I was such a huge fan of the Joker and I knew him front to back. But then to go into the script uh, for season one, especially um, trying to come up with my own version of this character, but not having really a grasp of what Telltale actually wanted for the character. And I think as the series progressed, they, they started to get to grips with that. But, but really every episode was written uh, before it was gonna come out. You know, they didn't have, here's the script for season two, like here it all is. It was like, here's the script for, uh, episode one, you know, of season two, and then they would change it. And then there would be, they, I would come back, uh, um, you know, a couple of weeks later and the scene would be totally different. Um, and that was, that was, uh, that was interesting, but, but it was difficult because you would form an idea of the character of where you think he's going, but then they would, they would again flip it. Uh, because John Doe in season one was a, a more menacing, um, uh, manipulative kind of guy. Uh, and then he became a real lovable puppy in the season two, in the beginning. And then, uh, and, and then they were playing with him becoming more evil much earlier. But then that, but they scrapped that. They, they, they ended up going with the more uh, sympathetic character, which was really interesting. But yeah, it was just, you know, learning as you go. <laughs> mm. And, you know, I actually noticed that uh, looking at John Doe from season one across to uh, season two, the Joker, as we know him, he's, he's more sociopathic um, mm -hmm. and he's, he's only out for himself. So when season two comes and flips that on, his, on its head and he's entirely motivated just by his own emotions. So mm -hmm. he's sort of controlled by the thing that in every other interpretation doesn't even exist within his own character. And mm -hmm. so do you think that lack of commitment um, to sort of knowing what's next in the story how do you think that actually affected your performance uh yeah um well i i saw everything as uh i knew there was an end game for sure like they did say look he's gonna be um you can treat him nice or you can treat him appallingly and he will change according to that so i knew that there was some sort of basis uh, a base play to, to play off of like that okay he he's not um he's not a villain yet uh and then it was, it was really just a sense of imagination there but um i mean i remember in in, in episode two of season two in the bar scene uh instead of bruce defending john john was going to attack willie and he carved his, his name into his forehead with a pen knife or something at the bar and we recorded all that but but it didn't make it in the final game because uh the, the test audiences didn't like that they liked uh, the build up you know and you were able to betray john in episode three instead of catwoman you could put john in the freezer you know and and stuff like stuff like that uh which which you know the, the diverging branches you know um and things like that but it was really just a question on their minds i think of how do we uh how do we play the joker differently 
you know, um, and that was, that was just interesting. And I was, I was along for it. I, I really enjoyed it. Um, all the different things. And it really was just a choose your own adventure. So I think I had a grasp of what they wanted. And then, and then if they would throw different scenarios at me, I could sort of adapt. Um, and that was, you know, it was fun. I, I really loved the character. Uh, and it was interesting to see him sort of play out the way he did. Cool. And so you being such a huge uh, fan of the Joker, what was your initial reaction to finding out that he could actually sort of become a vigilante rather than the typical villain that we all know and love? Um, yeah, I, I really liked it. I thought, um, ironically, I'm a, a massive Joker fan, but I love John Doe. Um, I think the first four episodes of season two are, are my favorites just because he was so, um, yeah, he was such a sympathetic character and he was a really interesting and engaging character. Uh, I think that's why he resonated with people. Um, and that was something that I really liked. And then the idea of him becoming a vigilante, I don't think had really been done before. There's a few, there was a few comics in the sixties where uh, Joker mimicked Batman, like he had his own utility belt and stuff. And I think they played that up in the episode. Um, but, but that sort of, genuine earnestness to be a good guy i don't think had been done before i could be wrong and i'm probably wrong there's probably someone in the comments that's correcting me but uh you know seeing seeing this this guy that's typically portrayed as a monster um was was really uh compelling and i, I thought it was it was really interesting to sort of play that up so i see that as the canon sort of story as opposed to you know falling into the old uh routine of uh, Batman versus Joker. Hmm. Yeah, it's interesting you say that. In, in my critique, I've said that um, due to this sort of like Elseworlds telltale spin on the character, uh, the Joker yes. is more of a villain to Bruce than he is Batman, which makes him all the more dangerous. Mm -hmm. So it was amazing to see that. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah. Um, I think the, the story that I think it um, coincides the most with would be like Frank Miller's Dark Knight Returns. I think that uh, that sort of um, codependency relationship between Batman and Joker was played up, I think, with the Telltale version. I think that's the closest in terms of uh, that that portrayal of the relationship. But I don't think it's uh, the Joker's ever known that Batman was Bruce Wayne, unless. Yeah. Oh yeah, in the, yeah. Again, I'm correcting myself. <laughs> <laughs> I see. Yeah, in the Return of the Joker, uh, Bruce uh, Hamill knows that. Uh, Hamill's Joker knows that it's Bruce, but but um, this one was like from the beginning. He he knew, but he didn't care. Like, and he didn't really care much about Batman as opposed from like the fanboy side. Like, he was more um, interested in Bruce Wayne, um, which mm. is yeah, interesting. Yeah, and it's, yeah, I'm I'm really really happy that you mentioned uh, the Dark Knight Returns because I remember when I when I first saw John in uh, episode four of season one, I think it was. Yeah, when, yeah. when, he, when he first saw him in the asylum. Um, and he doesn't have that like classic red pink lips and like the really pale face. It's just like a normal person, but with paler skin and sort of green hair. Immediately, it reminded me of like the reformed Joker from The Dark Knight Returns. Yeah. That was so <laughs> cool. <laughs> yeah, I, I think Frank Miller's um, Dark Knight Returns is probably my favorite uh, Batman story, and I saw that parallel like immediately when I when I saw the final uh, final product. I was like, oh yeah, I see what they're doing. <laughs> so, yeah, it's kind of yeah so then what's what are your favorite joker stories um yeah well well dark knight returns um the killing joke i think those those two were the two uh top stories and then i think um i think grant morrison's a serious house on serious earth i think it is i think that's the title uh I think so. yeah, yeah yeah could be i could be wrong but yeah that that's also a really good one um and yeah, there's a, there's a bunch from the '60s that I really enjoyed, like the Golden Age, um, uh, you know, where he was the trickster, like the, the story where he became a sort of a Batman uh, mimic with his little utility belt. I thought that was great. Um, and there's yeah, there's there's a ton that I really enjoyed. The Laughing Fish, which became then an animated uh, episode. <laughs> uh, yeah, there, there's a lot of really good ones. Um, and uh, there was also an interesting thing that I thought kind of played into the telltale uh, thing was where um you know spoiler alert that that his origin was that there's three jokers which mm -hmm. i thought was bizarre like there's three guys that play the joker and batman was like what so like <laughs> and that kind of explains how he is so different all the time 
but there's three guys that like take up the mantle of being the Joker. And I was like, Oh, that's kind of interesting. And that might play into telltale where like, it'd be hilarious if the John Doe from season one is a totally different guy than the guy in the funeral scene of season two. I would be like, that, that's so that's cool. Like, <laughs> and they meet in season three. That'd be brilliant. Um, I thought that would be, uh, yeah, that would be appropriate. Yeah, that was, the, that was in the more recent comics, wasn't it? Sorry? The, the whole three Joker storyline. That was in the more recent comics, wasn't it? Yeah, that was that was recently. I think that was within the last five, five six years, I think. I remember reading that uh, somewhere. Yeah, yeah very interesting storyline. I didn't read all of it. I only saw, unfortunately, all the spoilers out of context floating around the internet. Yeah, but <laughs> yeah it was circulating on Twitter where people were just losing their minds about this thing. They were like, what? So yeah, I, I read that as well, but I think I, I did read the story at one point. Um, cool, awesome. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so how do you get into the mindset for voicing the Joker? Uh, yeah, that, well, yeah, it was, at first it was just try not to do an impression. <laughs> so it was like, you know, I was trying to avoid that, that, uh, that, that, um, temptation and then uh as it went on i really got to grips with the john doe character um to the point that i forgot that i was sort of playing the joker um and uh the way he was written was very easy to empathize with so it wasn't a huge leap for me to um draw on my own emotions and stuff like that if if i had to play a guy who was awkward and nervous and stuff it's not that hard you know um and 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 that sort of fish out of war feeling um you know, it was, it was easy for me to draw on experiences from, uh, you know, high school being like the awkward new kid because of my dad's job, which I'll travel all the time. Um, and, and just wanting to impress and, and fit in and stuff and feeling, uh, you know, like the imposter syndrome, I guess. <laughs> so I think it wasn't, it wasn't that hard to sort of get into that mindset for the John Doe character. Um, and, uh, yeah, I think he was just, a, such a terrific character that it wasn't, uh, I, I never found it difficult to um, to portray this person. Like it was, it was a really earnest character, and I really, I really liked it. Um, yeah, it, and then the Joker was an, another story. It was it was like like trying to take that, do the Joker, but then you know make it different as well. So it was, yeah, it was it was tricky, but yeah, it was it was interesting because you kind of grew with the character over the course of like a year and a half. <laughs> <laughs> I actually find that so inspiring and just endearing that you, you managed to find a way to sort of relate to him on a personal level and then like manufacture that into your performance. That's so inspiring. <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, thanks. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. Well, I just, I just sort of, I felt it, it sounds cheesy, but I just, I felt a connection to him. Like I did really like him a lot. Um, and it was a character like I, uh, huge Joker fan, but I, I really liked John Doe. Like I enjoyed playing John Doe more. Um, and, uh, yeah, I was just, uh, finding that, that, uh, truth as the actor studios would call it <laughs> was, uh, was, yeah, that was, that was fun. Um, for me, I, I, I liked it a lot. Yeah. <laughs> That's so cool. <laughs> and I saw in the other interview, um, that you're talking about when you, when you're preparing to, to voice for him, you, you sort of get into the mindset of, uh, Jack Torrance from The Shining. <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh yeah yeah that was that was more more mindset yeah that was more um to calm myself down uh, <laughs> it was it was really the idea of playing, my girlfriend's right there she's trying to <laughs> um walked in the house with me during quarantine uh, um yeah yeah it was it was more of a, a coping mechanism just to deal with the sort of anxiety of playing this character um the the idea of just you know you're playing John Doe like enjoy it and then uh, you know Jack Nicholson's one of my favorite characters of all time but he's not the Joker in The Shining so I'm like okay kind of <laughs> and then <laughs> uh, I was always a huge fan of that movie and then it would that movie would just pump me up like uh, the soundtrack as well so like uh, I remember I was waiting to record and I was on a hot mic so like the microphone was recording and uh, I would have my uh, my phone in the booth and i was just listening to like the shining soundtrack like hey anthony what's that we're hearing in the background I'm like oh that's just me <laughs> never mind <laughs> but uh it was just a way for me to uh you know psych myself up to play this character and and, and uh yeah and, and just get into a more like agitated state of mind <laughs> i suppose 
Um, and yeah, that was, that was also just a, a, a sort of a ritual thing I did, which was, yeah, it was fun as well. That's really fascinating because The Shining has got probably one of the most iconic and just really unsettling scores in a movie ever. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's just that the, those, those sirens that just sort of yeah, slowly blare weird. out. Yeah. yeah, I saw, I saw the, um, the making of it and how they made the, the noises and stuff. It was, it was, uh, yeah, it was disturbing, but um, really good if you, if you need to get into a mindset for it to do something <laughs> outside of your normal uh, acceptable behavior, I suppose. Um, <laughs> well, was, I'd imagine uh, yeah. you wouldn't be walking around with a limp and an ax in your hand. <laughs> You'd be wrong. What? <laughs> Nobody knows me. <laughs> they don't know me. I could walk like that every day. Um, <laughs> Where's Anthony? You know, He's on his way to the milk bar. Just, <laughs> 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 uh, so, yeah. Do you, do you see any similarities between Jack Torrance and John Doe? Um... Well, any similarities, I think I brought them in myself. <laughs> like, just leak that in there. Um, but yeah, I, I would say the, uh, yeah, I, I would say the sort of, um, uh, the, the intense anger issues, and then the, which I, I thought was really appropriate for the character. Um, that sort of sensitive thing, but then snapping on a dime. Uh, I thought that would, that was, Interesting. And it's funny, I actually saw a comment where um, people sort of made that parallel, where it's like, yeah, he, he's a bit Jack Torrance-y. <laughs> I was like, okay, cool. <laughs> um, you know, and I, I yeah, so I, I'd say that. But I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm bringing some other stuff into this, but it wasn't, it wasn't like I was, you know, throwing that in there. But I, I was just, yeah, I don't know. I was just throwing darts at the wall and seeing what would hit, you know. Mm. <laughs> Oh, you managed to strike a bullseye every time, dude. So, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, that, that sort of uh, lack of impulse control that John Doe has just made him all the more terrifying, especially playing the game, because it was, uh, like, for me, when I was playing it, I was trying my, my hardest to sort of remain his friend, and you'd be like, oh, like, you're trying to take a selfie at a funeral. I don't want to hurt your feelings, but maybe don't do that. And he just gets really upset. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's one of the things that I liked was that his his total um, uh, lack of uh, self awareness and social norms, and I think that's what people found endearing about him as well. Like he he did it from a it came from a good place, like giving a get well card at a funeral. Uh, you know, not something that I would recommend, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> something that um, uh, yeah that 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 scene I think from the early on uh, established the mindset of the character for me, like, like going forward, I was like, okay, that's, it comes from a good place. Like everything he does, no matter how messed up it is. Um, and uh, that sort of perpetual victimhood that he had, even when he's found in a sea of bodies with his fingerprints everywhere and, you know, gunshot wounds all over the people. And he's like, Oh, self-defense. <laughs> uh, but you know, that, that sort of mindset, um, you know, once that was established, I found that easier to get into the, the headset of the character to, to uh, you know, find, find what makes him tick, I suppose. Hmm. Yeah, and you say that being surrounded by the sea of dead bodies. Um, when I played it, I don't, I'm not sure if there is a way that you can um, get to that fun house, I think it's called, if you can get there mm -hmm. with John, because I, I played it twice, but I did different ways, and I never found a way where I could go with him. I'm sure there is, but I'm, I missed it. Do you no, I don't think, I don't think so. No, I don't think so. I think, uh, yeah, cause we, I don't remember recording anything that I would know. <laughs> so oh, I yeah. think, uh, I don't think you can go there uh, with him, I think, and you can't see what actually happened. So it's open to interpretation, but, uh, I think the, the scene previous was him saying, you know, I'm going to, find out for you i think was that when he's drunk first and then he's like i'm gonna yeah, go yeah. have a look and like leave me alone and he was already really agitated and he was drunk so then he goes there and then who knows what happened uh mm -hmm. you know so i think that 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 adds the ambiguity of like maybe it was an accident or maybe they did jump him and it was self-defense um you know uh 
Uh, and I think that, that that's interesting, but it would be cool to do like a, you know, to see the game through John's eyes, like to see what happened, like in between the parts that Bruce sees, um, you know, just to clear all that up. Yeah. <laughs> like what happened, exactly what happened. Uh, that would be interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's scary to, to see that because you don't know whether you believe him or not. And just to see it through his perspective and probably the, the most frightening scene in the entire series for me was when um, Bruce and John share frappes at the, at the restaurant. And <laughs> it's a terrifying scene. It was terrifying. And John has that monologue where he talks about the man beneath the surface. And that oh, yeah. gave me so many chills when I played through that. <laughs> Yeah, that was cool. There was a scene, um, I think, I don't know if it's still, I think it might be, where he talks about how he had a hamster, a pet hamster or something. Oh, um, I don't think that's in the game. I think it's, yeah, I think I think it is, but I think they cut quite a bit of it. But he talked about how um, a mother hamster, you have to separate it because she'll eat the, uh, the babies or something. And he's like, it's not, it doesn't make her evil, it's just in her nature or something like that. But there was a monologue like that. Um, which, so yeah, you would go from something innocent and cute, like eating frappes to something really dark, um, which I found, yeah, I think that was, that was what made it, uh, interesting for me as an actor to play that. Uh, yeah, I kept it, kept it fun. Hmm. Yeah. And I especially like how, uh, when Bruce asks him what he likes about Arkham, out of all the things he could have said, he says the lights. And for me, it was, it was interesting because it's like he just, he's sort of drawn to that cycle of, you know, always wreaking havoc and then going back to Arkham where he's comfortable. And it was, yeah, it was very fascinating to see him say that out of everything he could have picked. <laughs> I don't know what, what, what the lights are like in Arkham, like what, what makes them nice exactly. <laughs> oh, they had a hum to them. That's what he says. <laughs> yeah, there was a hum. You can't get that on the outside, those humming lights. You have to order those. Yeah, there's, there's too much noise on the outside. <laughs> so what is the process for recording all of your lines for the game? Uh, yeah, well, that's the thing. I record all my lines um, from Holland. Uh, mm -hmm. So I never, um, I was never in the booth with uh, Troy or um, Laura. Uh, we never, we never played off each other, um, except uh, unless it was playback. Um, so it, it did take quite a bit of imagination on everyone's behalf um which was interesting but it, it was challenging as well because you would have to sometimes guess where another actor would take a scene but uh for most of the part i think the directors did a good job like they would they would take all that into account and they would sort of match it up and, and then it, it worked pretty seamlessly i think it, it works really well um but yeah that, that was that was a you know, fun. It was fun for me as well because I would just be alone in a booth talking to myself, which is kind of what I do here at home during the <laughs> <I> play. <laughs> but uh, you know, it, it, yeah, at times it was a bit challenging. But yeah, I think it's um, it's fairly fairly commonplace as well for um, most most productions, unless it's uh, motion capture. Uh, most actors don't really interact with each other. I don't think. Hmm. And so you didn't. There wasn't any. Uh, footage that you could like at least look at and, and see, sort of get a feel for the scene? Uh, no, not really, no. Um, that was that was one of the main things that I found uh, difficult was um, for a lot of scenes uh, the animation and, the, and the, 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 the scene building would happen after. So you would record a line um, you know, and, and I, I would never have the context of how far away is Bruce from, from me, like when I'm talking to him, because, you know, it would be like, it was a scene where Harley's talking to John about getting the laptop or something. And uh, I, in my head, I assume like, okay, there, it's a room full of people. John's in the back waving, saying like, I will do, I'll do it, you know, but turns out he's standing right in front of her. <laughs> so I'm shouting in her face. <laughs> it's like, calm down. You know, um, so it was things like that, which which uh, were were a bit tricky. Um, where watching it later, I was like, oh yeah, it should have been. You know, I could have taken that down or made it louder, um, and things like that. Uh, which which uh, usually I think you can match it to video, but you know the way Telltale was running at the time, uh, everything was sort of you know 
just hammer it in. Um, but yeah, that was, that was, that was tricky. Yeah. Yeah. Trying to, trying to put it together beforehand before you actually have any contacts or anything. Hmm. Hmm. And yeah. And, and even when John is screaming up in people's faces, I wouldn't even think twice about it just because that's how he is. <laughs> yeah. I think, I think it kind of fit the character, I guess. Um, but, but at times it was a bit jarring. Um, I think, but yeah, I think uh, for the most part, it, it did actually fit his, his personality quite well that he would just randomly shout. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so on the whole for the story, do you think there is an intended way to play the game? No, I think it's, well, I don't think there's an intended way. I think there's some scenes that are uh, missable, which is a shame. Um, one of my favorites is, is, is teaching John how to throw a batarang. Um, and you can only get that scene if you betray Catwoman, I think, uh, which is a shame because it's, it's one of my favorite scenes. But um, as far as like an intended way to play, I think, no, I think if, if you want to get what you want out of this character, you can play it however you like, um, which is what makes it interesting. Um, because it isn't really, uh, you know, well, it, it, that's the debate, isn't it, about the, about the endings, if they're that different. But I think in, in, in this particular story, I think the endings are vastly different. Um, and that's what makes it interesting. And, and, and depending on how you, how you treat this guy, um, you can get vastly different outcomes. And that, that I think, is, is liberating for a player. And I think that's, that's what makes it fun to play. So, yeah, I think uh, play it how you like. <laughs> Okay, so had you have played it, would have you picked the vigilante route or the villain route? Um, yeah, I should I should elaborate. I, I didn't play it not because I'm like oh, I don't want to play, it, but more like uh, yeah, playing it uh, myself. I'm a bit uh, yeah, it's, it's a sort of a self conscious thing. Um, you know, I can't really step away from it from a impartial uh, audience standpoint. I love seeing other people play it though. Um, I said that to Brian and Amelia that like watching them, them experience it for the first time was, was really fun. Uh, but yeah, I would say for me, like the vigilante option would be uh, my preferred route um, just because uh, it, it's more in keeping with the sort of John Doe theme. Uh, and just that, that this is really like, for me, it's like an Elseworlds story where everything is different. You know, uh, Bruce Wayne's parents are mobsters and uh, um you know, Vicky Vale is a, is a super villain. So it was, it makes sense that the Joker would be a good guy, uh, just in keeping with that sort of thing. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. I didn't even, I didn't even consider that. <laughs> it's cool. <laughs> um, so what is your favorite aspect of the game? Um, I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not, I'm not sure how to answer that. There was a, there was so much stuff in it that I really liked. Um, I thought the music was great and a lot of, you know, and I thought the, uh, the individual character interactions and the humor was, was really refreshing. And yeah, there was things, there was a lot of stuff that I really liked about it. Um, yeah. I, I don't know really what my favorite aspect would be. Uh, yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, there you go. <laughs> So in your own opinion, what do you think is next for the Joker? Uh, well, yeah, the Telltale Joker, I'm sure. Uh, I don't know what's happening there. Um, hopefully he comes back. That'd be great. I'd love to come back. Uh, but um, yeah, for the character itself, I, I think he's going to be around forever. I, I don't think that... It, it, you know, I mean, that was just a movie that just came out. And then three years ago, there was another movie that came out. And then we had Heath Ledger's Joker and we had all these different interpretations. Like, again, it's, it's a character that's open to, yeah, so many different reinventions. And, um, you know, that's what makes it interesting. It's not because it doesn't feel like a remake again. You know, like if you have another character or, or a film or something and you do it again, it feels like, oh, this is a cheap remake. But this with the Joker, for example, or Batman or anything, it's like a reimagination of this entire universe, you know, because it's not just the Joker, it's really then all of it. It's Gotham, it's everything. Um, so yeah, it, it's, I, I think the possibilities are 
I won't say endless, but uh, there's there's plenty of you know different um, interpretations that that this character can go through, and I don't think that we've seen the last of him for a long time, uh, which is uh, yeah, that's pretty interesting. I think. Uh, yeah. Cool, awesome. All right, um, yeah. So, if you could say anything to your fans right now, what would you say? Uh, I would say a huge thank you to everyone who has um, sent me, you know, a kind message or, you know, enjoyed the game or I, I got a lot of amazing fan art uh, that, that uh, was sent to me, which I just, I loved. I, uh, I made it, I printed a lot of it out um, and I, I try to share it and stuff. It's, it's fantastic. And, and yeah, just a, a deep thank you for people that love the game and the character and stuff and sent a kind word. Um, you know, being a fan myself, it, it was really um, touching to see that other people really enjoyed what I did. Uh, and that was a great feeling. Yeah. So yeah, huge thank you to everyone. <laughs> cool. Awesome. Uh, well, now that we're wrapping up, is there anything else you'd like to add? Um, yeah, just stay safe out there. Um, the world is uh, nuts as it always has been, but uh, even more so lately. <laughs> so yeah, um, just stay safe. And uh, yeah, um, thanks again for everything. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you for offering your time today. It was, uh, it was really great to be able to speak to you. So uh, yeah, yeah. Mike, thanks for having me. It was, it was my pleasure. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm actually a huge fan of, of Lego and I like some of the Lego games. I you know, play them with my brother and sister and stuff. Um, and I saw that you voiced uh, Johnny Quick in Lego DC <laughs> Supervillains. And yeah. I'll be honest, when I first played through that, I didn't, I didn't even notice at all. So it was amazing going through the credits and being like, hang on. <laughs> that was cool yeah. Was. yeah, that was funny. I, I recorded that, um, I think, a day before the last episode of season two. And it's weird that you didn't notice because I, I listened to it and I, said, I was like, oh, I sound exactly like John. Like I was like, I was so, I, I literally recorded it like the next day, um, the last episode, but, but uh, I was so in my head with Joker and stuff. And then they're like, oh, can you, can you voice this character Johnny Quick? And I was like, yes, of course, you know, Lego, like I love Lego. Um, but, but I, I, I did the voice and I, I listened to it and I was like, oh, it sounds exactly like Joker, you know? And I was like, oh, I should have mixed it up a bit. But so it's weird that you didn't realize that, but um, yeah, I, I loved uh, I love because I love Lego things, and so that was amazing to uh, get that opportunity. Um, and uh, I knew who Johnny Quick was as well, and he was Australian as well. And I first originally was like, "Yeah, can I can I do my Australian accent?" Because you know I grew up in Australia, and and they're like, "No, no, no, we want the American version of Johnny Quick." But uh, <laughs> but it's weird that you didn't realize it was me because I, I I played it, I played that game. I'm like, oh man, I sound exactly like Joker, but. Um, <laughs> Oh, well. Yeah, oh, your talent knows no bounds. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently it does. <laughs> oh. uh, and also, did you notice that with the game, I think they might have even paid homage to you in it, um, that you know, there's a mechanic in the game where you can take out a flip phone and take photos. And I found this completely by accident, trying to recreate a moment from the game, where if you play as the Joker and you take a selfie with Batman, you get a trophy called the Enemy Within. Were you aware of this? Really? I didn't yeah. know that. It was, it was so cool. <laughs> that's oh, that's amazing. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> that's crazy. All right. Well, you know, I'm going to play it again just to get that trophy. <laughs> that's great. I didn't know that. That's interesting. Because I told them, I'm like, hey, guys, you know, you're, you're doing a bunch of alternate, you know, because that game, the whole game was about, like, the alternate realities and stuff. And I was like, I will voice the John Doe Telltale version. If you can get the rights, I'll do it for free. Like, <laughs> if you can put John into the Lego game. But, uh, yeah, that didn't go ahead, unfortunately. But it uh, would have been cool. But, yeah, I didn't know that they did that Enemy Within thing. That's, that's really cool. From one Star Wars fan to another, mm. and obviously, because I'm, you know, speaking to Harrison Ford's future successor here, <laughs> who do you Where? think... <laughs> oh, right in front of me, dude. <laughs> Don't sell Where yourself short. <laughs> who do you think shot first, Greedo or Han? Uh, Han, and that's that's just an empirical fact. Um, <laughs> and then, yeah, Lucas, I love Lucas, but he literally photoshopped Han doing this weird, like, body 
you know, shimmy thing where the, the bullet goes like this and then it's like, and it looks ridiculous. So yeah, Han, Han shot him, but again, I didn't like that because it showed him to be a bit of a dick. Uh, I don't know, can I say that? Um, but like, <laughs> yeah, edit that. <laughs> it showed him to be a bit of a uh, rap scallion uh, that, uh, you know, the, 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 it showed him to, like he was too too tough and too hard a character, so they wanted to soften him up a bit, that it was like self-defense, you know? Um, but yeah, clearly Han shot first, obviously. Yeah. No, I mean, yeah, it made him look like more of a badass. I don't really understand why they decided to no, I don't do know why that. You, yeah, I know. It, well, well, I think because, yeah, I mean, it, his whole character in the beginning of the first film was a selfish self-interest, you know, doesn't care about anyone else. And then at the end, he saves Luke. So he does have like a, a character arc, even if he does shoot some mercenary uh, fish face guy you know <laughs> whatever yeah and did you see in the new they, they re-released it and I, I didn't watch it but i saw it on youtube that for some reason they added grito saying the word mcclunky yes <laughs> mcclunky i know i saw that <laughs> that was brilliant i love that thank um, you lucas yeah. Thrilling contribution. Yeah, no, never change. Like I'm, I'm saying to Lucas, like don't change. Like just keep adding new things to it. It just makes it. I mean, that film is like 50 years old or something. No, my is it? 1973. So I think it's. I think no, 77, isn't it? It's 77. Yeah. It's so. 77. Yeah. Yeah, it's coming up no. on it. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, I just just keep adding stuff to it. Makes it funnier. Like uh, like a giant uh, that giant walking thing that like they're you know ha um, I was gonna say huh um, where uh, Mark Hamill and Obi Wan are like in their speeder and then there's this giant thing that's like <laughs> and like blocks the screen completely and like why do that but okay I'm all for it yeah and you've got the random shot of it like swinging the Java for no reason whatsoever yeah, yeah I know I had that toy actually I bought that toy where the Java swings off of it that's great. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, a bit of Star Wars lore right there. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how relevant that is for the Joker documentary, but... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm sure it'll, it'll come in handy somewhere down the track, I'm sure. <laughs>